Oasis, these are your morning announcements. As you all know, during the holiday season, we like to put on an event to entertain and minister to our community. And this year is no different. So please join us and invite your friends and family to the Christmas Spectacular, Saturday, December 19th at 6 p.m. and Sunday, December 20th at 2 p.m. Tickets are $7 and you can purchase them by going to the events page. The link is on the screen. Tickets are selling fast. You wanna make sure that you're gonna be a part. We'll hope to see you there. Every year we like to host the Turkey Bowl on Thanksgiving, but unlike other years, this year we are gonna be doing it here on campus at 8 a.m. So make sure to invite your friends and family. We're gonna be playing football. The Macy's Day Parade's gonna be playing. We're gonna have hot chocolate, s'mores, and just a good time for all friends and family, whether or not you like to play or if you just like to hang out and socialize. It's gonna be a great time. So we'll see you here on campus, Thanksgiving morning at 8 a.m. Our favorite Sunday is coming up. That's right, Sunday Fun Day is coming up on December 6th at 6 p.m. It's gonna be a wonderful night. We're gonna be watching the movie Elf. We're gonna be having s'mores, playing games, and just a great time together. So be sure to invite your friends and family on December 6th at 6 p.m. Thank you so much for your generosity. Every time you give your tithes or offerings, that money goes back into our church to put on the events that you see, to our food pantry, and to those that are in need. If you would like to give, you can text the word GIVE to the number on the screen, or you can go to our website under the GIVE tab. And once again, thank you so much for your generosity. These were your morning announcements. Now it's time to gather your family around, stand up, and enjoy the service.
Hey Oasis Online, we are going to go back into worship, but before we do, I just want to quickly talk about the message today that Pastor Bill is going to bring very shortly, and this is our Thanksgiving message. Um, so it's it's really, I mean, I love the holidays. Uh, I'm sure that now more than ever, we all kind of need it. And so Pastor Bill is talking about having the attitude of gratitude and how um, happiness, you know, and just gratitude and thankfulness is a real solid human emotion that we can keep. And I, I believe that the Word of God is going to comfort you today, that Pastor Billy is going to give you a message that you're going to take with you, not just for today or for Thanksgiving um, or even for the whole holiday, but continuing on into the next year, you are going to uh, have something with you that you can take and be encouraged. So please be encouraged, grab your family, tag your friends, comment underneath, and let's have a wonderful service. Thank you so much for being a part of Oasis Online.
for all things great and small. Let us give thanks. Hey, good morning. Glad you're with us today. Whether you're listening on podcast or watching this via online, we're glad that you're taking the time to be with us today. You know, this week is a one of my favorite weeks of the year. It's Thanksgiving week. We got Turkey Bowl set up where we're going to be playing some football and uh, we've got some plans at our home to have a great meal, which is one of my favorite meals of the year. Uh, but you know, as we enter into Thanksgiving here in America, COVID numbers are spiking all over the country. Um, throughout our nation, their lockdowns are being mandated by people in government. There's restrictions be, being put on even homes to say how many people you can have um, at your house to eat dinner. We don't, we don't have those specifically here in Arizona, but it seems like the giving of thanks, maybe it's a hard thing to do. And I, I say, should it be? Should giving of thanks this year be harder than the years past? You know, many are calling this the year to be forgotten or, or others I've heard say the year from hell. What do you think about it? When you think about this year, what is the process of where you are today within your soul, in your mind? Or are you saying, man, I can't wait for this year to get over? And maybe as we enter into Thanksgiving, you're really not coming with an attitude or a heart that has much to be thankful for. And we've had lots of challenges, haven't we? We've had some international challenges, political challenges, social challenges. We've, we've had financial challenges that have happened for many. Some of you have had health challenges, maybe some relational challenges that have come into play, financial difficulties that have come. And, and maybe as you're looking at all the dynamic of your life, you're like, well, where can I give thanks? I, there's a lot of regret and, and sorrow that's going on instead of thanksgiving. So how, how, when you think about this, how are you reflecting on this year as you look to Thanksgiving? I'll admit, it's been a challenging year. As a, as a pastor, as a, a spiritual leader in a community where it's tough to get the community together and you're doing things like this online and communicating, there has been challenges. But I want to invite you today to let this moment, this week of Thanksgiving, be a, a, a recalculating or redirecting yourself back into this place of, of an, an honest ability to be able to give thanks, to have an attitude of gratitude. And I want you to know it's important. CNN this past year had a little article, and this is what they said. Research shows that grateful people tend to be healthy and happy. They exhibit lower levels of stress and depression, cope better with adversity, and sleep better. They tend to be happier and more satisfied with life. Even their partners tend to be more consent, content with their relationships. Why? Why is this? Well, the healthiest human emotion that we're privilege to have is one of gratitude. You, you might think it's love, but you know we, we can have a lot of love, but with it comes pain and sorrow and suffering sometimes because we love so much. But gratitude is something that has a unique capacity to create positive flow within our, our being. The endorphins and the dopamines that happen in, in the nature of gratitude, it increases actually physically, it, it helps our immune system. Being thankful, honestly, is a biblical way of responding to life. And so this week, I, I want you to, as we jump into the scriptures, as we ask ourselves this question about Thanksgiving and whatever you thought in my opening conversation of what you think you have to give thanks for, I know that you know, we all want to give thanks and none of us want to hear this word. No one ever wants to be called ungrateful, right? Maybe when we're kids, we get called ungrateful, but as adults, no one wants to be called ungrateful because as soon as someone says it to us, immediately we begin to think of things that we're grateful for and thankful for, and, and with it comes some of that positive thing. But most people that are ungrateful don't even recognize it. They don't see their misery. They don't see that they don't have really a lot of happiness because nothing is making them happy because they can't find anything to be thankful for. And the truth is, none of us want to be ungrateful. So as we prepare for this Thanksgiving time together, I want to invite you to understand God's dynamic of this thing called Thanksgiving and that it's a spiritual component of our lives. It's a, it's a spiritual response to our life because of our trust in God. And maybe you're not a Christian, maybe you're not a Christ follower. The values of Thanksgiving, just personally, and how it works within our lives is, is equal. If you're a thankful person, positive things are happening. You probably see life from a different perspective. But I want you to know there's a spiritual component to it that makes it so. The reason you get to experience the, some of those positive things is because this thankfulness or this attitude of gratitude is really a gift from God for us walking in a sense of comfort and trust and peace. I'm reminded of the Psalms in Psalms 100. It says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. You know, thankfulness is a, about embracing the life that God has offered to us and, and lifting it up. And, and again, we're going to talk about both the positive sides and the negative sides of what we're experiencing in life and going, do you realize that no matter what you're dealing with today, that you have the ability to be thankful in the midst of it? 
And it's in that thanksgiving that you can actually change the perspective, the, the paradigm of your life, and begin to experience the, the benefit and blessing of having a heart of gratitude. For us, as we learn to be thankful, it's good. It's a blessing. Learning, and here's something that's significant for us as we talk about this thing called Thanksgiving. Learning to see life as God wants us to see it will greatly improve your gratitude. We have an attitude of gratitude, my friend. That is not a platitude, right? We, we want to have a grateful heart. We want to be a heart that rejoices. And we're going to go to uh, the Apostle Paul who was... Uh, in, in the first New Testament church, he'd come to Christ as a young man, and he was anti-church, he was anti-God, he, he wasn't atheist, but he was totally against Christianity in the beginning, and, and he had an encounter with God, and it changed everything about his life, and he was someone that wrote a number of the letters that we find, the epistles we call in the New Testament, they're really just letters to people of him expressing his interaction with God, what he learned from that interaction, and, and value lessons that they can learn about how to live life. And one of the topics that he talked about was this idea of being thankful or having an attitude of gratitude. And I'm going to begin in Philippians chapter 4. And I want you to join with me if you have your Bibles. You can open them. Otherwise, you're going to watch this on the screen. It says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. What does that mean? It means take joy. Show joy. Speak joy. Rejoice. Be happy in God. This is an emphatic. This is a verb to say, I want you to take joy. I know when we start talking about this idea of taking joy, you might be going, well, I don't have anything to be joyful for. Now, I'm going to say, really? Uh, I think that maybe sometimes when we get wrapped up in the things that we're not thankful for or or the challenges that we're facing on, the focus and attention that we're having is on the things that actually bring us down. When there are many things that we have opportunity to look at that would bring us up in ourselves, he continues to go on in verse number five. Let your gentleness be evident to all. This idea to rejoice in God. Let what God is doing be seen by all. The Lord is near. I want to remind you today. I don't care what story has been told about you. I don't care what you've heard. God is near to you. His desire for you, his will for you, his purpose for you is ever present. We talked about that last week. He is ever present to be with you right now in what you're going through. And he wants to turn the emphasis of your heart from maybe sadness or sorrow or difficulties that consuming you to an edge of thankfulness. Here's the power of thanksgiving. Here's the power of gratitude, that it can be a measure, kind of a a waiting measure over the difficulties. When we begin to allow ourselves to have gratitude, the pressure that's on us to be sorrowful or regretful or or sad or or discomforted, when we begin to put gratitude into play, it evens us out into a, a position where we can actually experience real joy. So he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. That's... That's a big word, right? Anything is whatever you're dealing with. He says, I don't want you to be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. I love this portion that he pulls out to us. He's actually giving us a a unique pattern of how can we live with an attitude of gratitude? How can we reframe the world that we're living in and begin to experience this value of of appreciation and and of gratitude within our souls that that is palatable, that we can possess and hold and go, yeah, I really do have a grateful heart because of what God is doing in my life. Thanksgiving, this is what we're talking about here, requires us to actually, in the scripture, it's an element of faith that he's inviting us to walk in. People who have faith in God can live differently than those that don't because we realize that God is telling a story, a perpetual story. I know most of us, if we had our will and way, we say, well, I only want God to tell a good story through me, only happy endings, no pain, no suffering, no sorrow, only good. And I sure wish that was true for all of us, but we know that life has a measure of suffering in it, sometimes great suffering that we can find ourselves in or experiencing. And in spite of that truth, God invites us to this level of rejoicing and finding thanksgiving in the circumstance of our lives. And here's what we know. The reason why we actually can possess some thanksgiving and a rejoicing heart in the midst of difficulty is because we know that God hears our prayers. He hears our petition. It's not like we're speaking to the ceiling. God is, is involved in the conversation. He's hearing from us. And he's going to bring, we know he has the ultimate authority and the ultimate power to influence our circumstance and situation. But our trust in him isn't just about what he does for us. 
We're not only thankful because he gave us, we prayed and he gave, we prayed and he gave. We're thankful also because we pray knowing that he has a will and a purpose and a plan. And if that purpose and plan is leading us through difficulty, we can embrace that difficulty and say, thank God that, Lord, you are giving me the strength and influence to go through what I'm going through and still keep the joy in my heart. What is he saying? Don't worry. God is at work. I want to remind you that God is at work. And then he, then he tells us in this mode, if we're going to rejoice, if we're going to not worry about anything, but in everything, offer or come to God in prayer with thanksgiving and this supplication. He says this, and the peace of God, verse number seven, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Notice this protective mode. He says, and listen, if you do this, if you learn how to put this value in play, and I'm going to call it the law of appreciation, the law of giving value where value is due, finding that value. God says, listen, I'm going to promise that that peace is going to be a sustaining peace over your life, over your heart and your mind. This peace that is significant for our daily living. It, and, and the truth is, this peace we're talking about is a spiritual gift. It is something that God gifts to us to possess and to walk in. Imagine right now you woke up with a little bit of peace. Or imagine right now in the next 10 minutes that you took from the sorrow you came into this mode of listening and, and hearing what I'm saying and maybe the challenges that were upon you, the pressure that's on you. Imagine in a few minutes that peace comes upon you. Peace big enough and strong enough and overwhelming enough to subside whatever anxieties that you have. This is a piece that is a gift that God desires for you to walk in. And he's inviting us. He's giving us a pattern, a path on how can we walk in this piece. It is through the measure of walking in thanksgiving. God wants to remove the pressure of your difficulties. And again, when we think about it, we just want the difficulty to go. But I want you to know that God will give you what you need in the midst of what you're facing today. Notice it says we're protected. It says in Christ Jesus. Right? This mode of peace comes because we are in Christ Jesus. And I, I want to invite you. Put yourself in Christ Jesus today. What he has done for you. What he has provided for you. This is the, the power of our Christianity, of salvation. Right? Jesus Christ came to this earth. He lived a sinless life so that he could die on a cross to pay for our sins so that we could be saved. That in itself is worthy of thanksgiving. And maybe just take a moment, if you're a Christian here today, just give God thanks in this moment. Say, I once was lost, but now I am found. I once was uh, destined for eternal separation from God, but now I am gifted eternal life with God. That is worthy, my friend, of thanksgiving. These modes, as we begin to think about what Christ has done, it is in Christ Jesus and what he has provided, not just an eternal redemption, but a present redemption for what you're going through right now. I want you to know that you can give thanks even in the midst of what you're dealing with right now, because God is telling a story, and it's through this story that he wants to reveal himself to you, and not just to you, but through you, to the world that is around you. It is in Christ Jesus that we have. He goes on to say this as he begins to reframe and says, I want you to now take charge of, of what you're thinking, because what you're thinking is related to what you're saying, and what you're saying is related to how you're experiencing life. I want to change your experience. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. What is he saying? I want you to have a heart of thanksgiving. So I want you to reframe what you're thinking. You're thinking about what is negative, what is broken, what is, what is messed up, what is ungodly, or things that aren't lovely, things that aren't admirable. You're focusing your attention. He says, I want you to stop the mess that is destroying your soul, that is stealing your peace. And I want you to begin to take charge of what you are thinking. Whatever is true, he says, I want you to think on these things. Think about such things. Place these good things in front of you because it will change your heart. It will change your attitude in a moment's time. This is the invitation. And then he goes to say this in the very next verse, number nine. Whatever you have learned and received and heard from me or seen in me, Put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I love this statement. He says, I'm not just talking to you about an anecdotal philosophy. I'm living proof. <laughs> and the truth is, he's living proof in the real sense of the word, because when he's penning this out and writing 
to the individuals in Philippi where he's writing to them and telling them the story of grace. He's in jail as he's writing this letter saying, guys, I just want you to know that God is all that he says he is, that God can do all the things that he said he was going to do. And he's saying, I want you to put into practice what you see in me. Maybe this was for you today, for all of us. This idea of putting into practice. We need to practice the attitude of thanksgiving. The attitude of gratitude where we realize that God's telling a story and there's good to be found in the story that God is telling and having the ability to begin to perceive that within our spirit and to have faith to go, it's good that God is doing in my life what he's doing. Even though this is painful and that's hard and that's challenging, I know that God is good and telling a good story and finding the places of praise and value. I always say this and have talked about this a long time in my life is that there's something called the law of appreciation, right? It's, it's, bringing value. When something appreciates, it grows in value. What you are thankful for grows in value. Simple. The things that you show thanks for have a tendency within our lives to begin to grow in value. The things that you value within your heart and that you show thanks for have this intrinsic value. You know, depreciation, it means to what? To lower the price of something, to make light of, to lessen in value or price, to belittle. You know, some of us, that's all we think about, the things that are getting lower. You know, when you buy a car, immediately when you take it off the lot, it depreciates, it loses its value, and over time it becomes valueless. But God wants us to learn this law of appreciation, of things gaining in value around us. This appreciation, which is, there's a couple words of appreciation, and some of it we can begin to apply principally to our lives and to those that are around us. One of the things about appreciation is a grateful recognition. You know, when's the last time you looked at your spouse and saw the things that they did that you're grateful for and said, you know, I just want to say how grateful I am for X. I'm not going to ask you when's the last time you found something you didn't like about him and said it to him. I'm going to ask you when's the last time you just found something about him and said, I'm thankful for this. You know, I, I remember uh, we had some friends years ago that taught on marriage ministry and, and this woman had had, he just, she just got to the place where she loathed her husband and hated her husband. And she, she was really wanting to get a divorce and she did, had no desire for him. But she was a Christian. She was like, you know, man, God, I don't want to get a divorce, but I hate this man. And the Lord told her, he said, I want you to just write down something that you, that you appreciate about him, something that you like about him. She's like, at first I thought I could think of nothing. But then I said, well, no, he's a good provider. He, he provides finances for our family we're taken care of. And, and second thought, she's, she, he's a good father. He takes care of his kids well. And she began this list. Each day she would add something to the list of something that she found. And each day as the list began to grow and began to grow and began to grow, she realized that what had happened in her life is she began to, she, she was always focusing on the areas where he wasn't living up to expectation, always focusing on the areas where he was less than what he should be. And what happened over time is because all that she thought about, all that she c- c- contemplated, so all these negative things, her heart toward him depreciated. She had, he eventually had no value within her life. But when she began to add this list, a true list that always existed, all these things that she began to appreciate and something began to happen within her heart. This law of appreciation began to take place and the value of her heart toward her husband began to change. That's the power of the law of appreciation. Maybe you should take some note of that and begin to say, wow, I need to, there's some value of people that are around me that I need to begin to find the things about them that I can appreciate and be thankful for because I easily see the things that are negative in their lives. This is a valuable thing that we get to do, to do in our life. You know, I, I'm reminded that sometimes we don't see life as it is. We can tend to complain. We can tend to, to, to begrudge things. And I, I've always remembered the story of the, you know, the guy that's complaining about having no shoes until he meets a man with no feet. And all of a sudden, he's thankful for his feet. Right? The perspective happens. Change happens. And sometimes I think we always find ourselves in that place of complaining about what we don't have instead of being thankful for what we do have. Now, Paul goes on to say in the, in the very next verse in chapter 11, he says, For I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstance. And he's writing in a meaningful way. He's in jail. He said, yeah, I didn't write this up. I didn't want to be here. This wasn't the place I wanted to be, but this is where I am. I've learned to be content, where, whatever the circumstance. Verse 12 says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content In any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. What is the secret? Well, he's already told us the secret, right? This idea of rejoicing in the Lord. 
of finding the joy, finding something to be thankful for, being grateful in the manifestation of that thing that we have. And whether it's present that we see or present something we're believing to see, our faith that is extended, and that we invite God into the story. He said, listen, if you'll live this way, if you'll rejoice in who God is, you'll find that joy, you'll be grateful, you invite God into the story. This is the secret of being content. Because you know no matter what, that no matter whether you're in the best time of your life and finances has never been better, relationship has never been better, and maybe it's easy for you to give thanks and say, yeah, I'm, I'm really thankful today. I want you to know that when things go south that you can still have the power of that thanksgiving that's just as real and just as true. We're going to find something significant as we, when we close in just a minute about many people give thanks only when things are, when they get what they want. They're like at a kid at a table you know, at Thanksgiving, you know, you have the little table that kids sit at. You know, the, everybody takes care of the kids, bring them their food. But, you know, as Christ followers, God wants us to grow up and sit at the big table. That isn't just serve me, take care of me, give me. It's it, a growing place where we sit at the big table to be able to handle the, the more difficult challenges in life and still have that attitude of gratitude. Paul says, listen, I've learned to be content. You know, it's interesting. He was writing to the Corinthians in another book that he wrote of people that he was passing on information about how to live for God, how to live in Christ. And he talked about his own life and the challenges that he faced in himself and how he got his arms wrapped around these challenges. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, this is what he said. This is his prayer to the Lord. He's saying, God, I got some difficulties I need help with. I want you to fix something for me. I want you to take care of it. Can you just get rid of this problem? Isn't that how we pray often? I'll be thankful if you just get rid of this problem. This was his prayer. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, this is speaking of the Lord, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. In other words, what you're going through is a part of the design of your life. And I'm giving you what you need to make it through. My grace, my work in your life is enough for you to manage what you're going through. I know you want it gone, but I'm enough to give you what you need to make it through. And this is what Paul said in understanding this revelation from God, that when he was going through a difficulty, he said, God, please just get rid of this. God said this to him, I'm with you. I got you covered. Listen, in your weakness, I'm going to be your strength. This is his response to that statement. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am Strong. He basically said, listen, when life goes to hell in a handbasket, I don't get worried because I know God is telling the story through those difficulties, through those challenges, through those tribulations. And, and actually, it's in my weakness when things are tough that God is going to be seen stronger within my life. Maybe you need that strength today. Maybe you need that grace that is sufficient to be reminded that it is yours today. Maybe you're not a Christian and you know this all sounds good and you wish you could have it. I want you to know today you can open your heart to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and receive the grace that comes from heaven, the free gift of eternal life. But with that gift comes this ability to connect with God and have a peace that passes understanding where, where life would go to hell in a handbasket. You can have peace and a possession of that peace that goes, people will go, how do you have that? Because Christ is the centerpiece of our life because we know that he is telling a story and he's going to work all things out according to his purpose and his plan. Can you find an attitude of gratitude in your present circumstance? And Paul goes on to say in Philippians as he ends this conversation with them, and I love this, and we, we hear it said many times, but in, it's in context to his communication to say, listen, I, I have an attitude of gratitude because I'm rejoicing in God. I'm trusting in him that he's going to do what he's going to do. And whether I get what I want or I don't get what I want, I'm in a good place. He ends in verse 13 with this. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I want you to know that that's true for all of us. Sometimes it's not easy to give thanks. Sometimes it might be hard to see the things to be thankful for, but I want you to know that by the spirit and grace of God, that God wants to enlighten you to the things that you can begin to give thanks, to create that list of thanksgiving. And I promise you, it'll make a turn in your heart. And you'll go from an attitude of depression and and anxiety and suffering to an attitude of, you know what, God's going to get me through this and everything's going to be all right. And again, whether it's all right in the moment or eternally all right, it's going to be all right. You know, the psalmist David put it in such a beautiful perspective. He, he, he had highs and lows like the rest of us. And I love in Psalms 23, you're probably very familiar with this, but this really is a psalm of, of thanksgiving. But it's a true psalm of, of life. And something that as we close today, I'm going to read Psalms 23 and invite you to, to join with Paul 
I mean, with, with David and with Paul, for that matter, in understanding the dynamic of offering thanksgiving to God. He says this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Can you give thanks for that? Of course, when we have everything we want, it's easy to give thanks. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yes, that's awesome, right? Every time we see the goodness of God, we see the hand of God, a provision or blessing or, or with favor, we can go, thank God. Yes, look how good God is. But I want you to know that the most important time to be able to give God thanks is not just when it's so easy to be seen. It's when sometimes life comes at you difficult. Notice the very next verse of the psalmist says this, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. What is he saying? Is it, listen, when life gets tough, I'm not going to be afraid of toughness that life brings because I know life gets tough sometimes. I know, I know it gets challenging sometimes. He goes on, I will feel the world, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Notice the picture he's saying, life is difficult, challenging, suffering is coming my way, but God is with me. He has, he's still got that rod and that staff. That, that rod and staff is significant of, of a shepherd that when, when, when animals that would want to kill the sheep would try to come at them, the, the shepherds would take the, the staff and that rod and they would beat them away, they'd fight them away, they'd, they'd stand in the, in the gap between a, a sure death left un, uncatered to, that, that shepherd would come in and save. That's the picture he's saying, God, you're with me. You have what I need to survive. You'll protect me. He goes on to say this, and I want you to know that God is with you in difficult times. He is at work. Right now, you might not think that he's at work, but I want you to know that he is. And he wants you to begin to discover his handiwork. He wants you to begin to see and put your trust in him that he is at work. He, he says this, you prepare a table for me, in the presence of my enemies. Notice his statement. He's like, hey, even when things are going on around you, right when you're in the midst of where the enemies are, I'm preparing a table for you. You know, this week, God's like, like God, we're going to prepare a table at my house this week. We're going to tear turkey, all the fine fixings that are going to be there. I'm preparing a table for, for my family. My, uh, we have a family that, that are bringing things, and we're going to have a wonderful feast of a table that is prepared. I want you to know that God is preparing a table for you. Even in the midst of your enemies, God is providing for you the resource that you need to not just survive, but to thrive. God is preparing a table for you in the presence of your enemies. You anoint my head with oil. That sign of anointing is the sign of God's covering and protection still over him. He says this, my cup runs over. I want you to know that even in the midst of adversity, you can have this dynamic of things are going to be okay. That, that life is going to be, I'm still blessed in my life. You know, we've been walking through this journey with a young couple that has experienced a lot of difficulty and challenges and hardships lately. But being and sitting with them, I seek continually the idea, the statement that they make that God is with us. We don't know why we're going through this. We don't know why we're dealing with these challenges. But God is with us. And their cup is running over. Their, their ability to give out continues to amaze me. As they, as they suffer and struggle, they, they continue to find ways to minister to people and love on people and preach the message of hope to other people. Why? Because their cup runs over. Because in the midst of suffering and hardship, they found this place of thanksgiving and joy and privilege that even in the midst of hardship with their child that is going through physical issues and surgeries, they're going, you know, God's using this story to allow us to be who we are. Maybe you can grab a hold of that. And he closes with this last verse. He says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I love how he says, Listen, God's with me. He's good. His mercy is available all the time, even when I face difficulties. And ultimately, eternally, my life is secure in him. Thanksgiving has a great power to bring joy to our lives and to break the influence and power of the enemy over you. You know, some of you have been so overwhelmed. The enemy has been telling you all these reasons why you should be sad and depressed and anxious. You've been listening to that voice, but when you begin to give God thanks, you begin to break the power of the enemy. When he says, don't trust, you say, no, I do trust because God is a good God. He has my best interests in mind. Thankfulness is the key to successful living. It can turn the situations of our lives around, not because things change, but because we change. Our outlook change. Our hearts change. Our attitudes change. It's the power of a thankful heart. You know, discontentment can dry up our soul, but thanksgiving will bring us contentment. Begin to thank God for the blessings of your lives that he has given you. Push the negative things out. Begin to find areas and ways that you can celebrate. I love how the 
Um, Elizabeth Elliot, who her husband was a missionary that went down to preach the gospel um, down in South America. And he was eventually killed by by tribes that he was going to t- preach the gospel to. They, they thought there was good reception, but eventually he ended up dying. And she ma- wound up going through lots of difficult challenges in her life. But she made this statement that I think was so significant. She says, to love God is to love his will. It is to wait quietly for life to be measured by one who knows us through and through, which is God. It is to be content with his timing and his wise apportionment. It is to follow in the steps of the master, as did Paul, who was able to say that he had learned contentment no matter what the circumstances. I want you to know that today, as we enter into this week of Thanksgiving, that you can find contentment no matter what the circumstances. And not just contentment to say, I'm okay, but you can have a celebration of heart. You can rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice, knowing that God is at work. And that he's worthy of praise. And that through the celebration of your life and the celebration of what he's doing, people will see your gentleness. That you are found in Christ Jesus. That you offer your prayers to God and invite him into the situation with the confidence that God is going to be at work. So this Thanksgiving, choose to find your heart of celebration in Christ Jesus. Rejoice. Find joy. Give thanks. And invite God into your story. Maybe for some of you, inviting God into your story begins now. You're ready to let go of your troubles and your sufferings and your pain that you realize you can't do anything about. You want God in your life. Maybe today you recognize the need for Jesus Christ to be the centerpiece of your life. I want you to pray a prayer of surrender and dedication. Would you pray this prayer with me? Say, God, thank you for loving me. Today I give you my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and lead me in the path of truth. I want to have peace, the peace that you freely offer and the gift of eternal life. I choose to follow you with all that I am. I'm not going to live life all on my own anymore, but follow you. I do this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you're a first-time guest, we would love to have an opportunity to connect with you and give you a free gift for joining us today. Or if this isn't your first time, but you're ready to get connected, go ahead and send me an email and let me know how we can best serve you. We have life groups, both live and virtual, classes and resources to help you live your life in complete freedom. And you know what? If you're ready for the full on-campus experience, you can reach out to us via email as well, and we will get you connected with an opportunity to check us out and meet our church. Thank you so much for watching and have a blessed week.